actually I'll walk out from here. So we do have a slide deck uh, prepared for you. Like I said, I think the focus uh, this afternoon, we really were anticipating a lot of entry level folks potentially coming to the job fair. And so many of the slides were geared toward educating people that may be looking for a career in acquisition to kind of set the stage for what acquisition or contracting is and why this career field would be a good choice for them. So with that said, do we have anybody that's a current student uh, in the contracting profession? Or do we? Or is everybody already a current 1102 or program manager type in acquisition? How many Air Force? Mostly, mostly Air Force? Okay, great. So how many of you have been in the business for less than five years? Okay. Less than 10 years? And anybody more than 10 years? Okay, great. Great. Well, um, as John said, I've been in the business a long time. I started back in 1989. I, I learned about the field by accident. Uh, I was in, in business school at the University of Maryland. had no idea where I was going to land. But I thought, you know, I need to get a degree and I'll figure it out once I have my, my degree. And my husband at the time happened to be investigating the, the Pentagon, the Illwin scandal. Um, in the late 80s, and he learned about the Navy Mechanics for an intern program. So I, I entered the profession as an intern for the Department of Defense, and they, it, it was at a time where we didn't have computers, typed up the 171. For the new folks, you probably never even heard of the 171. Yes. Yeah, okay. It's <laughs> five eight months. Yeah, so, so uh, typed up my, my 171, put it in the mail, I get a phone call. They interviewed me over the phone and they placed me down in the Washington Navy Yard uh, where we were supporting naval commands all around the world. Didn't have a clue what I was getting myself into. They put me in a contract administration branch. Uh, and to this day, I still credit much of the success that I've had in my career due to that experience because I learned what not to do because I was cleaning up problems. And I, I probably had 50 different contracts I was administering at any given point in time. And, uh, and, and really, I was just fixing problems. I was solving problems. I was bringing the contractor and the program side together to find mutually acceptable solutions to the problems that we, we were experiencing. Uh, so that was a great starting point for me. Um, I ended up moving into the R&D world, which uh, was really a lot of fun. I talked with the interns. Um, at length about just the cool things that we were buying in, in the R&D environment. So I uh, spent a number of years doing that. Uh, then I had the opportunity, we were actually on base realignment closure list. And so I loved my job. I was in a, a really nice uh, facility with NAPS up. Uh, we were very productive, high quality work, high quality throughput. We, had, we just had a really good operation going. And, Unfortunately, we were on the list to be, be shut down, so I was kind of forced to go find another job. So at that point in time, I moved over to Health and Human Services and worked for the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. And I did uh, a lot of their uh, strategic IT systems contracts, and these were very large, you know, upwards of a billion dollars. So um, didn't really have an IT background, but you learn it, you figure it out, and, and, and learned a lot from that experience. And, and while there, at, after coming back from some training, I thought, wow, the acquisition-related training, I, I said, wow, we really need to improve the training that we're providing to our acquisition workforce. And it was that moment in time I got interested in the training or the organizational development side of the house and I had the opportunity to move over to the program side and, and dabble in, in training and organizational development. And did that for a number of years. I did do a little stint out in industry for a while. And when the VA Acquisition Academy decided to open its doors in 2008, I made the move there because it was the opportunity to kind of blend the operational contract experience, the training and OD experience, to try to help make some improvements to, to our acquisition business. And uh, I will tell you that I've worked in this business where it's been, it has been a lot of fun, and we had cranked out a lot of work, and, and there was a lot of balance to that. I'm, I'm uh, bothered by kind of the state of where we are today, and I don't know if anybody that's really satisfied, no matter where you sit as an acquisition team member, whether you're industry, whether you're 
a contracting officer, contract specialist on the front lines, whether you're the program, whether you're the finance people. I don't really know of anybody that can honestly say that it's going great. Anybody in the audience feel that way? Okay. So, um, you know, I've, I've been in the business at a time where I could say it was going great. And so I'm an optimist. I'm hopeful you'll hear as I go through the slide deck about some of the innovative things that we're doing at the VA uh, to try to turn things around. Um, and, and I'll go through a little bit of the history, too, in terms of why I think we've gotten to where we've gotten to. Um, and, uh, and share with you the things that we're doing at the Academy. When uh, Major General Masiello was talking about uh, targeting and developing some programs at the mid-level, I think that's where it's at. I think we've done a great job with the entry level and the intern programs all across government. I think we've, we've missed an opportunity to provide career growth and developmental opportunities for our mid-level. And so you'll hear as I go through the slide deck a lot of things that we're going to be doing and already are doing that's really targeted to our mid-level acquisition workforce to help them be the best that they can be in, in their careers and help them grow and develop. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started. And please feel free, we have a small group here, so feel free to, I'd rather have this interactive than me just standing up here talking the whole time. So if you have any questions, don't be shy, raise your hand. And, uh, So you all are not new to acquisition, so as I said, this was kind of set up to help educate students that might be interested in the field. And um, just to give you a sense of, of uh, the VA, um, we, our acquisition workforce, when you consider our program managers, our cores, our finance folks, our 1102, we're, we're about 32,000 plus strong. So that's a big acquisition workforce. And the reason the VA stood up its own academy was because Defense Acquisition University couldn't meet the demand that we had. And in fact, even today, we actually have some DOD students coming to our academy for training. And, and we have 10 other civilian agencies that are also using us uh, for, for training for certification. I like to believe that they're coming to us for more than just certification. Um, you know, as a leadership team at the academy, we talk about, I want to make sure that people are coming to us because they feel like they need having learned something of value, they really have something that they can take back and apply to the job. So, but, but our primary focus is to help train, educate, certify the VA acquisition workforce, which is over 32,000 people. And we're responsible, through that workforce, we spend over $17 billion annually. So it's a fair, fairly sizable amount of spend. So here's just a snapshot to, to, to illustrate the magnitude of discretionary contract spend. You all probably have heard this number. It's been going down as a result of the budget situation, but I think FY13 we were over uh, 400 billion. It's a lot of dollars that are being spent. DOD certainly has the greatest share of, of discretionary contract spend across all federal agencies. As John said, I came from Health and Human Services, one of their operating divisions. The uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So uh, you all have seen in the news uh, health care reform and, and the website, and I was in the thick of all of that. So <laughs> prior to my return to uh, the VA, and I can tell you what an incredible experience that was to be involved in, in that, uh, that, that initiative. Very complex. The law, obviously, very controversial, very complex. You've got about eight major departments or agencies that have to play nice together. And you've got the lawyers getting involved, you know, arguing over jurisdictional issues, interpretation of law. And um, so we had many challenges there. You've seen the reports in the news and you know what those are. Uh, but from an acquisition and a contracting standpoint, I really learned a lot. Um, and, and we will probably be abusing some of those lessons learned into some of the training that we offer in the academy. <coughs> So how we got here? So I think you know, many of the challenges that we're experiencing today really are the result of, at the end of the 1990s, we really started downsizing. Our acquisition workforce started shrinking. At about the same time, our discretionary contract spend was going up. So the people who were in the workforce didn't have the opportunity to go off and get any training, right? Because they've got to get the contracts executed. They've got to get that work done. 
workload increased significantly, and it hasn't let up since then. When I came up the ranks, I, I was in a system where I had a contracting officer that wasn't carrying a full-time operational load. So they really had the time to review my work, give me really thorough, meaningful feedback, and course correct me early on in my career. The reality of today, and, and you know, if anybody is experiencing something different, please let me know, but what I have observed in multiple agencies, both DOD and the civilian agencies, is out of necessity, our contracting officers had to pick up a, an operational load. In many cases, a full-time load. And I don't care how good you are, <laughs> um, while you're trying to manage your own workload, to, to give that thorough review to the people that you're responsible for growing and developing and giving them that meaningful feedback, um, I, I, I think we've been strained there. And if you're fortunate enough to have a situation where you do have a CEO that's, that's able to do that, you consider yourself very lucky. Lucky because across the board, that's not what, what I have observed. And so I've been a big proponent, and at HHS, I actually um, implemented um, some organizational structure changes to get back to that model. I, I was, we've got to get that workload off of the CO. We've got to get that CO back to what they're supposed to be doing. And that was a tough step. They're going to get worse before they get better. But, but I think having those conversations with the stakeholders to say, if we don't do that now, we're never going to be any better off five years down the street. Do you have a question? Yeah, in the VA, how many, how, when you have, for your COs, how many buyers do they have? It's, it depends. Two, five? It, it could be, and some of my VA uh, colleagues, do you guys have a sense out in the field? How many per, per CO? How many? Per CO, you're looking at about four to six at the Tech and Technology Acquisition Center. I'm located in Austin, Texas. I mean, it's just different, I guess, everywhere. I don't I mean, like just, to me, it seems it, it seems like that's such an obvious thing, and I you know, I see it all the time. I've been I've seen it for years, um, just in acquisitions in general, where CEOs, like you said, they're so busy with what they have on their plate, but they don't realize if they teach four other people to do it, literally they have almost nothing on their plate if they do it right. Right. Absolutely, and I, and I will tell you, in HHS where I was at. When I got there, it was one to 30 on billion dollar programs. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. So we made the business case for a, an organizational realignment to get that down to one to 12. Okay? And we need to be doing that government-wide. And we need managers and leaders that know what data you need to pull together, how do you do benchmarking, how do you build your business case, how do you engage with your stakeholders to get that buy-in and support? How do you talk with the CEO, the finance people? Because and so we, we started hiring a lot of people. And and so as you transition, as you start mentoring all those new people that you're bringing on board, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And so you've got to manage the expectation with your stakeholders and just say, look, you got to understand we're moving in the right direction, but it's going to get worse before it gets better. We need you on board with us. We need you understanding that this acquisition next year may take a little bit longer, but we're going to be better off long term uh, if we employ this strategy versus not doing anything at all. Another question here, yeah. Yeah, are, are we going to end up with a lot of teams and very few work employees? Uh, I'm just curious because that's what, I, what I've noticed when you say the level of management, but all of a sudden when there's one manager, there's like three others over that same person now, and that, that same person you have to be careful of that. Uh -huh. You have to make sure that you know you're structured appropriately. And each organization, you know, one to twelve, you know, was pretty good compared to where we were. Um, but that's still an awful lot of people to be responsible for. Well, I honestly say there's like one more year, three managers on top of one more. Really? Wow. We're getting so talk heavy. Right. Well, and I, I think there's truth to that as well. I think part of our problem is that around the same time, the 1990s, the downsizing, more outsourcing, and, and particularly in the Washington, D.C. area, we, we started seeing the grade creep that if you weren't going to promote somebody to a GS 13, 14, or 15, they go down the street and they get one of those high graded billets down the street. 
And uh, I joked when I came into the profession, the career ladder was to a 12, and my husband at the same time, we were both in career ladders to a 12, and at the time the salary was $36,000 a year. And we thought, if we both ever get to the 12, we're going to be living like kings. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm telling you, the 13s, 14s, and 15s, when I entered the field, they were rare to get. And I know you all are out in the field, and I don't know what the grade structure is like at Hill, but I can tell you, in the Washington, D.C. area, if you're good at what you do, non-supervisor with GS-15, we're a dime a dozen. Dime a dozen. And, uh, and then, you know, they're on big, major procurements. Uh, and so what was happening in the Washington, D.C. area is, is there was so much job hopping. People were moving all over the place at, at around this same time. And so you were losing lots of institutional knowledge. There was a lot of churn going on in, in organizations. And the new folks that were coming into the field around that time, they, they couldn't go, there wasn't money for training, and they didn't have the time to go off and get training. So many of those folks are now in management leadership positions, and there's some question as to whether or not they really have the technical skills foundation to understand the business. And I'm not saying I've seen great pockets, you know, there's pockets of success. I'm not saying that every mid-level manager or senior leader doesn't have what it takes, but I'm seeing some gaps there. And so what we're doing at, at the academy is we're, we're uh, enhancing our mid-level curriculum significantly. And again, I'll, I'll talk about the specific things that we're doing in, in that arena. Um, so we had acquisition reform. I think the great tools to speed up contract awards. And many of you haven't lived through this transition, but at the time we thought, oh my gosh, multiple award IDQs, this is going to be the greatest thing things in sliced bread, only to find out on the contract administration side, oh my gosh, now we've got to administer all these individual orders as though they're a separate, separate contract. So we didn't anticipate the spike in contract administration that we would have as a result of, of FASA. And then the technology boom, the turn of the century. And I, I think in many ways, while technology was intended, and it has in many ways helped us do our business better, I think we're trying to manage an awful lot of information and data. And, and I think there's an expectation that just because I've got an email in your inbox means that you can respond immediately. We're still humans and we still need to do the analysis appropriate to the situation. And so I think many people have gotten really impatient. They want it done now. They want it done yesterday. And so I think that's, that's created this stressed federal acquisition system. The other uh, point here on the uh, bottom right here is I have observed a decline in critical thinking and written communication skills. And writing is one of my pet peeves. Uh, and, and I think it's probably been my greatest asset in, in, in my success in this business is the ability to do the complex analysis, translate the results of your analysis, and the conclusions you've drawn to a written document so that any eighth grader can pick it up and understand why you're doing what you're doing. And um, I've read, on many of these large programs, I've read 200, 300 page source selections. And I get to the end and I still don't understand why we're doing what we're doing. And then I get really mad. Somebody made me read a document that large. So we need to do a better job of telling our story. And, and these are two areas that we are focusing on significantly in the academy to try to improve the skill set there. And then on top of all that, the workforce has changed. This is, in, in all of our history, we have, I think, four or five different generations now in the workforce. And so that creates opportunities and it creates challenges. And I think uh, for the younger folks that are coming into the field, you may sense some frustration or just some challenges working with the older folks, and at the same time, the older folks working with the, the younger, younger generation. And so present some challenges. And uh, I think we've got great tools for, for communicating, but I'm not sure that the communication is better. And I'm a big believer in storytelling. I'm a big believer in having conversations with people as opposed to emailing. It drives me crazy when you've got two people sitting in cubes next to each other and we're emailing each other back and forth. And so um, I, I think. Uh, that we need to find a way to bring all of these generations together and find that happy medium to do, to do our business. And this is just another graph depicting the, the generations that we've got in the workforce. And, uh, 
And so I think, you know, when I look at the young folks coming out of college today and the young folks entering the profession, really smart. Um, way smarter than I was when I came out of college. And then on the other end of the spectrum, the older folks, the institutional knowledge and wisdom that they have in terms of how the organization runs, there's a lot to offer them. And I think if, if everybody can understand and appreciate our differences, we can make the system work better. So just a little bit more about the Department of Veterans Affairs. So we are the second largest cabinet behind DOD. We employ over 330,000 employees geographically dispersed all across the United States. We have the largest integrated health care system with over 2 million veterans enrolled in health care. And we have three administrations in the Department of Veterans Affairs. We have the Veterans Health Administration. That's our largest administration. They account for about 70 to 80 percent of our budget. And that's all about delivering the health care services to our veterans. And we've got over 150 different medical centers across the U.S., um, 800 community-based outpatient clinics, 300 vet centers. And uh, so that is our, our largest program office, if you will, within the VA. Our Veterans Benefits Administration, we uh, put out more than $10 billion annually in educational benefits to more than a million vets. Um, we also uh, help uh, veterans and families uh, get, get loans for, for housing. Um, and then finally, our National Cemetery Administration. We have 131 cemeteries across the U.S. Um, that's pretty amazing, an average of 115,000 vets a year have been laid to rest. Um, you know, when you hear that, it really, really hits you that there, there's a, a lot that have, uh, have paid the ultimate sacrifice. And then 90% of veterans have burial options within 75 miles of home. So this is where our $17 billion in spend is spent across these three administrations within the VA. And so, as I said, in 2008, um, the VA senior leadership, because DAU couldn't meet the demand that we had, uh, established our own brick and mortar training facility in Frederick, Maryland. And we chose a suburb of Washington, D.C. because lower per diem, we bring a lot of our acquisition workforce physically to Frederick. Uh, we wanted a lower cost per diem area in Frederick. We say great restaurants, great shopping, great public transportation. And uh, we occupy an 80,000 square foot facility. Uh, we, we started, uh, we have five schools within the academy. We have our acquisition internship school, that was our flagship offering. And as John said, Joanne Choi is our vice chancellor of that school, and she's done an amazing job of, of really pushing out a lot of entry level folks into the, into the workforce. So we started there, and since then, we built a program management school. We have a uh, supply chain management school, a facilities management school, and a contracting professional school. So around, they get the experience to fail in a safe environment before they have to go out and do it for real. And so we do also uh, just have, uh, at, at the end of this program, our interns have satisfied all of the training requirements for you, DAWIA uh, level one and two, or FACC level one and two. So at the end of the program, they walk out. They still need the experience requirements, but at least they've satisfied the training requirements. We do have our intern sign a three-year continuing service agreement. It is quite an investment that we're making, so we want to make sure that we're not investing and then they walk out the door as soon as they graduate. So we have them sign a three-year continuing service agreement. And then the other track, so in our internship school, we actually have two tracks. We have uh, the regular acquisition internship track, which is a two-year program, will go out and we'll recruit back. We we're getting ready to uh, issue an announcement, a vacancy announcement, in about two weeks, uh, two weeks, uh, we'll, where we will recruit up to 30 GS7s. We'll start them as GS7s, uh, and we will actually hire them for vacancies that we have out in the field across the union, the United States. So we have sponsors, VA hosting organizations across the, the uh, nation. I think we're up to about 115 sponsors now across the United States. So we will actually hire those 30 interns, we'll place them out in the field, and then they come to Frederick, Maryland, 
over the next two years at various intervals for the training. But they'll stay together as a cohort through that entire two-year period. Career lag goes to 11, I think. Yeah. Um, and that's only because some of our sites, field offices out across the U.S., some go to 11, some go to 12, and we figured let's break it down to the lowest common denominator. There may be opportunities for 12s and 13s, but uh, we wanted to establish that career ladder at, at the 11. So, so that's our two-year intern track. Then we have a three-year Warriors to Workforce track. And this is, we're so excited about this offering, and we stood it up in 2011, and we've got two of our uh, uh, Warriors to Workforce interns here. And if you stay for the next session, you'll get to hear about their journey in getting to where they've gotten to today. But we wanted to find a way, because of the positive education requirement for entry into the 1102 field, we wanted to find a way for our returning wounded veterans who did not meet that positive education requirement to create entry into the profession. And so what we did is we created a program where we hired them in as 1105s, 1105s, GS5s. Year one is focused exclusively on academics. And we partnered with a local university who comes in, they're paid the GS5 salary, we leverage the GI Bill benefits, and we're not you know, paying for it per se. But we, we bring them in, year one is focused exclusively on the academics. And, and at the end of year one, they, they meet the 24, on the civilian side of the house, they meet the 24 semester hours of uh, college credit or business credit that's, that's needed to enter the 1102 profession. So after that one year, we convert them to 1102s, and then they transition into our regular two-year feature program. And that just has been an amazing program. And, and it is targeted to our veterans with service-connected disabilities, 30%. Um, yeah. Let me ask a question. I just have a lot of students I'm interning staff. Now, and I work sometimes with VA people, but um, do they already want to have a college education? Are they, not so, W to W. Not w. The regular okay. intern track, they have to have a business degree or the 24 semester hours. Okay. But W to W is 30% or more service connected disability, mm -hmm. little to no post high school education, they're eligible for our program. And this I can find, can I find it on the, just the VA website education? Yeah, and you can talk with Joanne afterwards. But so we'll, you know, we'll issue a vacancy announcement, or actually I think we're using VRNA hiring authority. We're working through both rehab and we're trying to identify candidates that oh, way. Both rehab? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, did you have a question? Yes, um, are there any uh, waivers for the 30% disability? No, it, it needs to be the 30% more disability. And so, you know, what, what and, and I think it's, it's worked really well, and you guys can chime in if, if you'd like, but, you know, we wanted them to focus on the academics and not have to worry about navigating the complex VA bureaucracy for the benefits that they're entitled to. And so I hope that we've taken that distraction away from you and we've helped facilitate. We're even putting a telehealth room in our academy so that they don't have to take leave to drive to the medical, nearest medical center. Um, we've, we've helped figure out how to get them the stipend that they're also entitled to. So in addition to the GS5 salary, we've helped facilitate getting the stipend. So we wanted them focusing on their education. And as a result of that, the average GPA in a business school curriculum for our first cohort was 3.7. That is awesome. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, pretty amazing. I mean, a business business school curriculum is pretty tough. And, uh, you know, they were committed. You know, uh, you guys, you know, we all know veterans make great employees, and you guys have demonstrated that over and over and over again. And so, you know, 3.7 in a very tough and we also have, and I think I have a slide coming up about the, the elements of this program. Um, yeah? Oh, sure. You mentioned the vocational rehabilitation for the W2W. And usually the work for vocational rehabilitation for the two year program. Yes. As well. Yes. Yes. Um, so, you know, we have the business education that we talked about. The other element that I think really makes our program unique is we have what we call peak performance training. And this is all about the mind-body connection. 
and how to manage our stress levels, how to um, really stay focused, and we that's a part of the, part of the training. They get one-on-one -on -one sessions uh, with a, a licensed PhD who meets with them once a week, and they get hooked up to all sorts of gadgets, and they're able to see their brainwave activity, their breathing, their respiration, they're able to see all of that on the screen and really understand kind of how they're feeling and, and how that relates to how they're performing. And we're seeing, I, I think there's definitely a causal or a correlation between that and the, the 3.7 GPA that, that we saw. And we saw, if you look at just the raw data in terms of the baseline of where they were when they came in as a group compared to where they are. Do we have that slide up here in terms of, I don't know the statistics off the top of my head, but it was you know, things like 154% memory recall. Um, just, I mean, it was off the charts. The, the growth that they experienced from where they started was significant. And um, so that's an important element of the program. Uh, introduction acquisition in year one, they get a little bit of introductory uh, content around what the business is all about, what role, future role they're gonna play. And then mission service. Mission service is a part of all of our offerings. We wanna make sure that we stay connected to the mission and that folks understand uh, why we do what we do. And so each of the cohorts and groups within the cohort pick certain mission service projects, whether it's going to medical centers and visiting with VA uh, veterans, um, whether it's going to a homeless shelter and helping to renovate the homeless shelter. And so we leave that mission service project up to, up to the interns. And, I, th I think that helps you really kind of bring it all together. And we want to make sure that we never lose sight of why we're there. I mean, we are here to, support, to serve and support the veteran, and really important part of our program. So I've already talked about the internship program. Do I miss anything here? Oh, on the job training. So the two-year program, they get three or four job rotations. They get four job rotations within the program. So as I said, our two-year track, the interns are hired out in the field, then they come to the academy at various interviews, but they'll get four job rotations. Well, I guess they're at their host site. They're doing their, their actual on-the-job training. And, and through that piece as well, um, we spend a lot of time with our stakeholders in terms of setting and managing the expectations. So after the first block of training, you know, we want to make sure that our host organization doesn't believe that they can come back and do a FAR Part 15 major source selection. So, you know, we kind of start with the simple stuff and then we work with our stakeholders to try to, to line up. When they come to you after the first block, this is the kind of work that we're hoping you'll have available to them. Second block, you know, it starts getting more complex. We, we work with the, the uh, stakeholders to make sure that we get that, that work lined up. And then, we get our stakeholders actually rating the intern's performance as well as our performance as a program in terms of did it meet your needs, what gaps still remain, what can we be doing better. And so it's a very comprehensive collaborative process to make sure that we're optimizing our investment. Yeah? How long are each of these of the four training blocks? I think it gets, it gets, they get longer in duration. Joanne, do you know off the top of your head? Uh, the face-to-face training, face training, I guess there, you mentioned there's four different times we return to the academy from the field. How long are each of those four? They range, and the first one is the longest, it's about three months, and then after that it's four to six weeks. It might be a little more for the Warriors to work for us because they're in their home station, and so from a cost perspective, it's best for them to be home for a period of time, not only from a cost, but also doctor's appointment. But we're finding this cohort model, I'm sure similar to the Copper Cat program, really effective to keep people connected and creating that network very early on in the career. And so to, to remain in the cohort, we started actually, our program started as a three-year program. We've since whittled it down to two and we're looking to maybe even shrink it a little bit more. As I said, I've, I've been involved in intern programs where it was three months to three years. And so, you know, we certainly understand the sensitivity to pulling people out of operation, and so we want to try to accelerate that time of proficiency and minimize the disruption to operations as much as possible. 
Yeah. 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 So again, we were trying to pitch this as for the students that are, <laughs> it really is a, it's an incredible career. I mean, you know, the, the ability to, to contribute to our nation in such an important way. Um, you know, from national defense to healthcare to now serving our veterans, it's been an incredible career journey for me. And uh, I think we need to be doing a better job of, even in the, in the high school, you know, our guidance counselor is really talking about this profession. Um, because as I said, I kind of landed in, into it by accident, and I am so glad that I did. Um, we are also, one, a uh, couple other things real quick. So, so we are looking to establish a co-op program where right now the entire federal government, we, we hire a person into the 1102 series or the program management series, and at that point in time, we make the investment in the training that's required for certification. There are many colleges and universities across the United States that already are delivering the core classes that are needed for certification. So what we'd like to do is shift the investment the federal government is making in that training by recruiting students that have already made that investment for us. And more important than that, though, is Hopefully, when you hire them then, they can be more productive more quickly for you. As I said, our current intern program is taking two years. If we could shrink that down to 15 months, 18 months, and we can put them out into operations more quickly without compromising the quality of, of that intern, I think that, that makes good business sense. So we're exploring that, we're exploring using the uh, OPMs Pathways program, there's three tracks in that. There's the intern track, there's the presidential management fellows track, and there's the recent graduates track. So we're, we're looking to uh, maybe test out some different models of delivery of our intern program. Um, the other neat thing that we're doing related to that, and, and on a broader scale, we're starting to do, and General Massiello talked a little bit about this, more of that cross-functional, cross-fertilization training. Right now, our five schools in the academy are kind of targeting to the 1102 population, program management population, facilities management, and, and the supply chain management. We're going to start creating a lot more training opportunities where we bring the entire team in. And we're starting with the critical thinking series. Um, and, and it's going to, the first workshop will do the critical thinking series in the context of source selection. Let's bring the program people in, the legal people in, the contracting people in, maybe the finance people will, you know, will, will include anybody that wants to come. And let's, let's really think through the implication of the evaluation criteria that we select early on to our source selection decision down the stream. And we've joked and we've said, you know, when the, when the students come into the room, we're going to take their cell phones, their Blackberries. We're not going to have access to the internet. We're going to really make them think <laughs> without having tools. And I think in some ways, and I'm a fan of templates and samples, but I think in some ways, you know, I, I see people copy and paste a lot of stuff, and they're trying to force fit something into an old template that doesn't make sense. And so, um, so we're looking to bring the team together. Another offering probably on the heels of critical thinking we'll do something around I like to call it market intelligence as opposed to market research because I think we need to be out in front of of the market and the industry understanding what capability exists before we have funding for a real requirement. We need to be doing that on a regular recurring basis. And I personally am a fan of market research one on one sessions with industry. I've never turned a contractor away. Never. And in doing so, that has resulted in shrinking requirements definition significantly. We're spending way too much time in requirements definition because people are afraid to talk to industry. And so we envision a market intelligence course where we're inviting industry in, contracting people, program people. So what are the rules of engagement? How do we do it and maintain the integrity of the process? How do we do that and manage our workload? Because if you let one come in, you know, can you turn others away? So, so understanding how do you juggle all of that? So we're really excited about those cross-functional training opportunities. And, and I do think that 
If we can get people coming together and we're learning together and we're having dialogue together, we can bring some of those things to the, the forefront that are getting in the way of our ability to execute the function. So there's all the difference, the tips for success. We're gonna talk about how do you distinguish yourself. Um, so as a, a, as a student trying to get into government, um, I tell you, we, we'll place a vacancy announcement in a week's time, we'll get thousands, 3,000 applicants. We've got, I don't know if you guys are experiencing the same thing. Um, and the HR system is less than optimal. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you get a cert and you have to read through and, and figure out, you know, which folks that you're going to select. So if we can establish some of these co-op programs, we might have a better chance of really targeting to those that really um, are going to... Uh, going to put meet the bill there. Um, so applying for the job, we just you know, want to tell them, make sure you read the announcement. Because I've seen these crazy things where you'll have a checklist, <laughs> okay? And then there's an item that's required, but it's not on the checklist. It's, it's in the narrative. So we tell her, please read the vacancy announcement and make sure that you submitted everything that, that you need to submit, your resume. Um, I've talked about this. All right, so with that, any questions before we wrap it up? All right, well, wonderful. Thank you all very much. Thank you.